Hello adventurers, welcome back to Adventure All The Way. I'm Emma and I'm a mum of three from the UK. If you're a returning subscriber or viewer, thank you so much. And if you're new here, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so glad you found us. Um, so today, we're not gonna talk about home education today as this is a Friday video. Today we're going to talk about autism. Now, if you've watched my videos before or follow me on Instagram, you will know that my eldest son, Charles, was diagnosed with autism two years ago. Um, it's, he has what would have been called Asperger's syndrome back when they used the term. However, they do not use the term anymore. Um, and they, we also don't use terms like low functioning or high functioning or anything like that. He has an autism spectrum condition or an autism spectrum disorder, depending on how we want to put it. We prefer autism spectrum condition um, because it's just a condition of who he is. It's not He's not disordered in any way. Um, and I think the medical definition of disorder maybe fits that, but we don't like the word. So we prefer to say ASC, which is autism spectrum condition. Now, around the same time as Charles was diagnosed, a paediatrician who was seeing Bessie for another for another issue um said oh did you know that we'd talked about how Charles was on the autistic spectrum and she said oh did you know that um she was having some digestive issues <clears throat> and she said did you know that they can be um um they can coincide with autism as well and she is quite quirky and we were like that's code for you want to refer her on um so we we spoke about it with a paediatrician and we spoke about it with members of our family who knew Bessie well, and friends who knew Bessie well, especially those who were healthcare professionals or training to be healthcare professionals, um, and as well as her forest school teacher and a few other people in her life that know her well, um, and, and you know, in a, in a professional capacity as well as a, a friend. Um, and they all agreed, you know what, she's right, we deal with, and a lot of those people know neurotypical children because they've been around them a lot. Um, and and they were like yeah yeah it's worth a go so that was two years ago when she was five she's now seven which is also the same age that charles was when he was assessed so we were like oh maybe they just wait until they're seven or maybe the waiting lists are just so freaking long <laughs> here in the uk best the nhs um so today is the 13th of April and we are finally coming to the ADOS appointment. Now, if you don't know what an ADOS appointment is, that stands for Autism Diagnosis Observation. And I can't remember what the S is. Scale. Autism Diagnostic. Diagnosis or Diagnostic Observation Scale. Sorry. Um, yeah, my brain. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> So what they're going to do is they're going to play with Bessie, basically, and they're gonna judge her, judge her, I guess, judge her, um, her reactions to things they ask her to do. Now, obviously, we've already been through this with Charles, and the idea is that they want the child to go in alone so they can see how they react without you around. But when Charles did his two years ago with the same company, which is called Pecon, um, they, he did not want to go in, he refused, he regressed loads, he got very anxious, he became non-verbal, he had his blankets and his teddies with him, and he just refused to go in without us. I had to carry him into the room, and then he hid under a sink, and I was like, dude, you've just like ramped up the autism behaviours, <laughs> like, because it was such a stressful situation, he just like totally was like, <gasps> like this, and I said, you know, if he had any control over them, you would think he'd just like turned them on for the purpose of this moment. <laughs> but obviously he doesn't. Um, yeah, so he was asked to do some role play activities, puzzles, games, story making, um, all of that sort of thing. And um, and I could tell some of the things, because I've done a lot of research on it, I could tell some of the things that they, they were, if he was a neurotypical child, what they would have expected him to do. Um, and then like other things that he didn't do and stuff like that. So. Um, I'll go into more depth with you in, if, when we get back uh, because then it'll be fresh in my mind rather than two years ago and I'll tell you exactly what happens with Bessie. Um, she's quite anxious about it, I'm not going to lie, she's quite nervous um, and um, and I'm quite nervous as well just because I, you know, it's not nice when they have meltdowns, it's not nice for them, it's not nice for us, uh, I don't really care about them, anyone else but you know, like, <laughs> um, and, and only I can go, so if she gets anxious, it's all on me to help her calm down. There's no Phil there. With Charles, Phil was there. And Phil's mum, the children's Omar, came with us as well as an extra support, um, which was really, really helpful. And bless her heart, she's amazing with the children. Um, and, um, and and Charles really loves her, so it was really helpful to have that second, um, that third adult as well as a second adult um, to kind of support him and of course we didn't 
like we went in and sat both of us went in and sat with him um for his ados um but only i can go phil can't even come and he can't come into the building it's a hat just has to be me and if i'm allowed in if she gets very anxious and needs me there um which i think she will i think she's gonna refuse to go in the room unless i'm with her but then i have to sit there and i have to ignore her so i can't interact with her in any way while i'm in there i'm just there as a supportive role um, if she needs a hug i'm allowed to hug her but i'm not allowed to speak to her um because they want to be able to see any autism behaviours if I know how to de-escalate a meltdown in, in them. So if we get, if I feel like it's bubbling, the anxiety is bubbling, I know how to bring that anxiety down to, pre to prevent the meltdown. Now it doesn't usually, it doesn't always happen. Sometimes they're gonna have a meltdown, they're gonna have a meltdown and they just go. Um, and the best thing you can do is just take them to safety so they can finish that meltdown in peace and come back. Um, and then they need lots of hugs and kisses and, and gentle attachment centered touch. Um, but obviously, you know, I do know, I'm with them all the time, they're home educated, they're with me all the time, so I do know ways to de-escalate their anxiety before it gets way anywhere, before, anywhere near a meltdown point. Um, and in this situation I wouldn't be allowed to do that, I wouldn't be able to do the techniques that we do to calm them down. Um, so I just have to let it go, just let them go. Um, which is hard, it's really hard to witness, so... Um, yeah, so we are, the time now is quarter to nine. Her appointment is at 10 past nine. And I went with Charles, we had to go to um, Aldershot, which as you know, we live on the South Coast and that's about an hour away from where we live um, in Northern Hampshire is where Aldershot is. So we had to go there to a hospital. I think it was like Aldershot Hospital or something like that. Um, and that was a bit of a pain in the bum because we'd never been there before. And then we were all nervous. Are we gonna be late? Are we gonna get stuck in traffic? And so on. Um, it was very stressful. Um, I think the second appointment that we had, which was the the history appointment where we go from, you know, birth to um, to now, um, <laughs> we actually were late because of traffic. It was absolutely awful. Anyway, so this time they said, oh, um, you know, are you OK to come on? They rang me last week. Are you OK to come on Tuesday? And I was like, whoa, thinking, oh, my God, we're going to have to go to Aldershot. We have to find childcare for the other two. Um, I'm going to have to make sure Phil's got the day off so he can take us because I wouldn't feel confident driving that way when I've only ever been there once, maybe twice. Um, and they went, oh, in your town library. And I was like, what? <laughs> That's amazing. Yes, we can walk there. We live within walking distance of our library. That's amazing. Um, so that's going to be really nice. We're going to go. For, we're going to leave in about um, probably in about ten minutes, five ten minutes. Um, I just got to get my socks on. Get Bessie's socks on. She's getting dressed right now downstairs with her brothers and my husband. So um, yeah. I'm I'm nervous, and I was like, I wasn't going to do this video until we came back, but then I was like, actually, talking to you guys is like therapy for me sometimes. So oh, need to just do it now and then we'll um talk about it when i get back so i will see you in about an hour and a half because that's how long it'll take including walking down there and um, i'll let you know how it goes see you in a bit Hello, we are back from our ADOS appointment. Um, it completely went, it completely threw me actually, because it didn't go how I thought it was gonna go. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so with Charles's appointment, I'm just gonna take off my jumper. Excuse me. Um, with Charles's appointment, we just sat in, we had to ignore him and he played games um, with the, with the um, therapist and um, then, and then that was it. Um, and we just, just weren't allowed to interact at all. But this one, it was really cool. Quite, they had a sheet for me to read and then instructions for me to follow, which was really difficult to like do the things in the moment and then read the sheet. Um, so we had to play three games and I had to talk to her. I had questions to ask her through the um, through them. They had little cards for me to um, to do to answer, ask questions. They're very specific questions about friendship and about feelings. Um, so one of the questions was, um, you know, um, do you feel lonely? What do you do to make yourself feel better? Do you think other people feel lonely? Um, um, pick someone at home. Um, what makes what makes you happy? Pick somebody in our house. What makes them happy? Um, and and other things like that. So it was. Um, we started by playing a basketball game, so we each had to take turns and play it. She was like, no, I'm not taking turns. Um, and I think that was probably quite indicative. 
and we just had to chat while we were playing it and then um then we played um pop-up pig which is you put hamburgers in the pig's mouth press down its head and then when it gets full it explodes um we didn't get to that point we ran out of time um and i had to ask her um what makes her happy what makes her sad what makes me ha what makes someone in, in the family happy um does she have friends and and how does she know that someone is her friend um and then we just chatted for a bit and then we played pop up pirate and i had to ask her some more questions so and i had to ask her um what makes her fr does something does anything frighten her um do does she ever get lonely do, do does anyone do what makes her feel better when she's lonely um what makes her what you know just do, do other people get lonely and um what her favorite food was i think was another one um i had, I had other things i had what her favorite food was talking about pets talking about holidays that sort of thing like trying to get her to discuss her life um i found it really difficult because um obviously i'm a natural conversationalist proven by the fact that i talk to a camera um all the time and so i'm really i'm really good and, and also i have one autistic child and potentially another autistic child and then a potentially autistic husband um and philip will be one of the first to admit that he's not an easy conversationalist like sometimes you do have to like drag stuff out of him like you'd be like how was your day he'd be like it's fine it was fine and then i have to like probe him and ask interesting questions and like drag it out so he tells me actually what happened during his day um and um and it's the same with bessie and with charles albert's just like me he's a complete chatterbox like he'll tell you a life story and you're like dude i didn't ask for that <laughs> um so him and i have really easy conversations but you do have to kind of pull information out of phil and the kit and the other two so um and the lady did notice that she was like is that normal like do you have to like prompt her and um and pull things like is that a normal conversation that it's like you doing the talking and her responding but not responding a lot and i was like yeah that's really normal for her um and i was like where well, she's home educated i'm used to getting her to do things that she doesn't want to do and getting her to talk about things that maybe she doesn't want to talk about and like it's natural for us to be like this um but she really struggled with taking turns in the basketball game and i didn't realize because when we've played games at home and she feels safe she doesn't struggle taking turns like sometimes i think she forgets that it's her it's not her turn but you just remind her and she's like oh yes it's your turn it's your turn and there's like a real because i think there's structure in the game because we play the similar games all the time she knows it's my and we go in like an age order so it'll go um albert bessie charles me or something if we were playing a game so she knows that she goes after albert but before charles but this was different because um it was just her and me and she was like well mummy's not going to yell at me if i don't take turns so i think i don't know whether she was like that or whether she just didn't really understand that we were taking turns um yeah and then the same with the other one it was really difficult to get her to take turns and talk at the same time like she couldn't really cope with taking turns and answering my questions at the same time she would either do one or the other so yeah i think we have our history appointment on the 3rd of may um so i will um update you after that so um just to give you an idea um of what to expect in this it was it was very parent and child relationship centered and that's not what the ados has been for us in the past so um yeah if you are um if you have an ados appointment coming up it may be very very different to what it would have been pre-covid um pre-covid they would have um been interacting with the child themselves rather than watching their interaction with you so um like that's a really um yeah it's a really really different experience for me so um i hope that that helps with the autism um assessment um with the autism assessment like what goes on so um the next bit is history appointment so that will be for us as i said on the 3rd of may and we will have a zoom call with the pediatrician um i think it's a psychologist rather than a pediatrician like but a pedi pediatric psychologist and they will ask us how my pregnancy was they will ask how the birth was they will ask what she was like in her as a baby what weaning was like what feeding was like what her toilet like pot nappy changing stuff was like um 
how she reacted to things as a baby, milestones, and then all the way through they'll ask similar questions all the way through until present day. Um, and it's, I mean, I find this appointment easier because I have a memory like an elephant and just remember all of these experiences and stuff. Whereas Phil just is really quiet in these appointments because he's like, I don't remember what I had for dinner last night, let alone what her weaning was like when she was a baby. So, <laughs> um, that'll be mainly a me centered appointment. And he does want to see Bessie, um, in the appointment as well, whether or not she'll stay very long because no one's doing like FaceTime games and stuff like that. It's another matter. Um, but yeah so that will be the next appointment and then after th during this history appointment the doctor will say yes I think she has autism or no I don't think she has autism and if she does they will just give us a piece of paper and it's literally a standard template form and it says this child Elizabeth Beale has autism spectrum to condition and then he signs it and, and in this case I imagine he'll fill it out and they'll email it to us within a couple of days I imagine that that's like the COVID version but they gave it to us like here's an April piece of paper off you go bye bye your kid's got your kid's got autism see here's some here's Bernardo's and here's um autism Wessex here's autism Hampshire bye <laughs> um and that was it don't expect anyone to be like okay so now this is how you can parent your child and this is support you can access for them and don't expect anyone to be doing anything for you after this point as depressing as that sounds um if you are struggling then there are places you can get help autism west like for us in our area autism wessex which is um um like dorset side and then autism hampshire which is obviously the hampshire side and anywhere everywhere in the country has um you know like a county-based regional-based autism charity that can support you um they do parenting classes they do mentors mentor systems like depending on the charity and um but you're not going to get any support from the nhs no one's going to um roll out any sort of help other than what you can access through these charities i believe bernardo's does um like parenting classes helping you understand autism more and that sort of thing i think after this point your best bet if you haven't already is to join um autism support groups on facebook or any other kind of social media um because i found that has been completely um it's been completely um it's been really really valuable but also um look into specific styles of parenting that suit people who are neurodiverse who still children who are neurodiverse so for example therapeutic parenting um attachment based parenting gentle parenting all of this kind of stuff because traditional discipline um does not work with neurodiverse children at least without consequences when they're adults um so um you will then receive after your history appointment they will then write up all of the information into a report the two reports will be merged the one from the ADOS and the one from the history appointment will be merged into a form into a report now the report isn't this is the child's issues and this is what can help them this is literally just a word report of what happened in the ADOS and what you said to the doctor in the history that's it I was really disappointed when Charles's form came through I was like I knew all this already, I was there. <laughs> um, but obviously other people don't. We actually used ours when we were applying for DLA, we did send the report with, we sent a copy of the report, we sent it with um, with his application for DLA. And um, I think because it's like a medical thing, I doubt they read it or understand understood what was going on because they're not medically trained at the good old DWP. But um, they it did kind of go, look, see, he was diagnosed, it's an actual report. Um, and I think that helped so that's something that I will discuss in another video later on is um, my guide to applying for DLA for your specifically for your autistic child um and we will um we will go forward in another video talking specifically about that so thank you for joining me for my autism assessment and diagnosis what to expect video um if you would like more content that's talking about autism um autism parenting and um specifically because my lived experience is autism is parenting people with autism um not being autistic let me know um i would love to be to add that to my um quiver of support for my lovely viewers don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already and like this video if you would like more like it have a great week and i will see you soon bye